Welcome to Parenting Decoded, a podcast for practical approaches to parenting. I'm Mary Eshin. Thanks for coming back to listen to part two of my screen time rules. I hope to build on what you learned in part one so that you can deal with the more complicated issues when your kids are old enough to have their own phones, laptops, and computers. It's a challenging world out there, and I want you to be well-equipped. In part one, we talked about family screens and how to set limits with obedience, and if there's not, how to set up effective consequences. Now in part two, I'll cover my final five rules dealing with older kids when individual cell phones, laptops, and other electronics come into play by about middle school. However, with COVID-19, this is happening even earlier. It seems that these rules will apply to lots of elementary school-aged children who are now doing online school and have access to tablets and laptops that they view as their own. I do want to mention a few things about how teens and tweens use their devices before I start. Common Sense Media's 2019 survey of media use in teens and tweens, they say by age 11, 53% of kids now have a smartphone. And by age 12, it's 69%. That's a whole lot of phones in the hands of very young people. I was also amazed to see that 69% of teens are watching YouTube every day. Other interesting info in the survey was about how boys' and girls' media tastes vary so much. While 70% of boys 8 to 18 say that they like playing video games of any sort a lot. Only 23% of girls say that. 41% of the boys play every day, while only 9% of the girls do. Girls, on the other hand, love to listen to music. 73% they say they like it a lot, compared to 59% of the boys. 50% of the girls say they like using social media a lot, while only 32% of the boys do. I mention these stats just to give us a common ground to think about how these rules we're going to discuss fit into the lives of your kids. With that said, let's dive in. Rule 9. Use contracts. I highly recommend that every family introduce a digital contract whenever personal electronics are about to appear in your kids' lives. Notice the timing I said about? You want to leverage your child's willingness to listen and negotiate with you while they don't have a phone or a laptop yet. It might seem a little ridiculous to bring in a business-type document into your family's life, but you just have to trust me. You'll really need this to get through things in the long run. Actually, I take that back. Don't trust me, but listen to what happens to families when rules around electronics aren't defined ahead of time. Let's say at eighth grade, your child gets their first iPhone. Woo-hoo! They are so happy, and you are the most amazing parent. Your child says they'll be responsible, and since they are so sweet and, and happy, you all rest easily. That is, in, until they start staying up late watching YouTube videos, or you find them texting at all hours of the night. You ask them to charge in the kitchen, and they do it for a while. They constantly have their phones in their room when they're doing their homework, and it just never makes it to the charging station at night. Hmm, they need it, they say, to get help from friends. Sure, you say. However, each time things get a little more out of whack and your child gets annoyed with you, bothering them about being on their phone so much. You start taking it away when they are sassy to you or when they don't do their chores. It becomes a weapon in your relationship. All the while, your child retreats more and more to their room, closing you out of their lives a little bit more each day. Fighting and yelling escalate? You come to me wondering what you can do. You have no relationship left. You've killed it fighting about the phone, and you've driven your child away from you when they actually need you the most. Frightening, isn't it? Well, it happens all the time. Yes, all the time. If you're a parent in this situation right now and relationships have been badly damaged, then you might need professional help. It's a super tough place to be. Our pastor at my church 
called Trying to Take a Cell Phone Away from a Teen and Create Boundaries after they've had unlimited access would be like choosing to start World War III. However, if this isn't you and you still have a relationship with your child you can build on, then you're in luck. Start now and things can go well. I don't want to be overly pessimistic since it certainly is true that many of us will weather the storm of electronics in our lives. But we just never know which one of us will be hit with a hurricane, so you might as well weatherproof as much as possible. So let's get back to the concept of setting up a digital contract. First, when's the best time to set it up? Before your child has access to individual devices. You will be able to have discussions with kids who are drooling at the prospect of getting their own phone laptop, or tablet. However, if your school's already issued them a device for schoolwork or you've purchased one for them to use in this crazy time of COVID, just go ahead and introduce the idea of a contract now. I'd set up a family meeting to do it. What's in a contract? This is going to be a family document, and it will need to evolve over time as your kids' needs grow and change. It'll look different for a fifth grader than an eighth grader or even a high school junior. It needs to evolve, and it should be negotiated, not dictated, if you want to up the chance of compliance and be able to have a healthy relationship as you go through the teen years together. The structure of the document will remain the same. It'll cover location of devices, location when they're in use, location when they're charging. Remember that rule number one about no no devices in the bedroom? That would be in the document. The use of devices for homework, for streaming videos, for gaming, whatever. You'll also list the time of day devices are used and what times of the day in terms of after homework or chores. You'll also talk about who has access to download apps and what passwords are required to tell parents. Um, You'll include rules for when parents can monitor the phones. I, I kept random checks as a possibility with my boys at all times. You're going to also define consequences. This is what I think is the most important part of the contract. Have your kids help define these. The compliance goes way up when they participate in creating what they think are reasonable consequences. And I would encourage you to have differing levels of consequences based on the types of offenses, like not charging their phone in the kitchen might be one type of of consequence, whereas being on the phone at 2 a.m., on a weekday, watching YouTube might be a different type of consequence. Downloading apps without permission, yet another type of of consequence. And I want you to think about an expanded possibility of consequences. What do I mean by that? I want you to include things like extra chores or outdoor activities, not just taking away electronics as the only consequence, which many of us are just using one consequence, which is to take away the electronics. Keep in mind that when you take away electronics, our kids think we're mean and uncaring. The entire time they don't have them, they focus on how much they are mad at us and not at themselves for their poor choice that they made when they chose to break the digital contract that you all agreed to. I have a sample contract on my website, and I'm going to put a link to that in my pod, in the podcast notes. It was written by a family with a seventh grader and a freshman in high school. You can even download the file and edit it to work for your family, but you can also feel free to surf the internet. There are lots and lots of sample contracts available. Setting up a contract with consequences can be tricky since kids don't want Big Brother beating down their necks. However, even though kids don't want to be monitored, you making sure that there's a way to do so that's part of your family life when they are young It gives you some avenues in dealing with things if your child steps over the line and needs to be reeled in later. I want to make a few notes on contracts during COVID. First thing is that you want to update them as things change. It's totally fine to make modifications to the contract at times like these. Many parents are doubling their kids' screen time limits or using outdoor chores or time as ways to earn more screen time. Be creative. And get it in writing so that those things are done. Also, you must figure out ways to monitor and use consequences that you've set up. 
Rules without consequences prove to our kids that there are no rules, which leads them to running their own show and ruins our family relationships and trust. Rule 10, use monitoring software. Monitoring software is something that you can put on your child's devices that can watch and alert you proactively for certain behaviors you and your family deem unacceptable. Say, for instance, no bullying. Monitoring software is tough to come by and none is 100% of what we might like it to do. One company called Bark has monitoring software that I think is pretty good. I don't work for them in anything, so this isn't a, I'm not getting paid to say this, but its motto is monitor, detect, alert. It doesn't prevent. That's kind of what parental controls are, are trying to do back in rule number five. It uses artificial intelligence to quote unquote watch apps that your child is using, like Snapchat or Instagram, TikTok, whatever. And it alerts you if it sees patterns of words that fall into the category of bullying. It doesn't shut down access, but it allows for conversations to take place between yourself and your child about what you've been alerted to. One friend's son was watching porn in high school. His dad had no idea. Once dad found out, they were able to discuss the issue of porn and decided to install Bark. It's not meant to be invasive, but helpful. The thing to know is that the Bark interface needs to be installed on each app on your child's phone with their consent. If you set up your child's cell phone correctly with a digital contract in place that specifies that Bark is required for all apps, you'll be in a good place. It does cost about $10 a month or $99 a year per family. I think it's worth it, but only if you have a good relationship with your child because they have to participate in installing it on their phone or their, or their devices. There are a few other tracker types of software available, but they all have limitations and require cooperation from your kids to use, which means having a good, trusting relationship with your child is going to be your best bet in protecting against digital issues in the long run. Rule 11, talk about online safety. Rule 10 is pretty complicated since it implies some big brother, you know, monitoring that our kids absolutely don't want in their lives. If you set up ways to have open conversations about online safety starting when they're young and growing in topics and scope as they get older, you'll have a chance that you can raise digitally aware kids. In the contract, you should be specific about some safety rules like no giving out personal information, no bullying, what to do if bullying occurs and such. All of these topics, however, that are in the contract need to be talked about so that your family is all on the same page. You need to address things like answering the phone when mom or dad calls, but also about ghosting and canceling friends online that is super toxic and hurtful. Have those discussions. Talk about sexting and how it impacts lives and reputations. Ask your kids if they've seen any of these behaviors. Talk about why people might do these bad behaviors. Nearly 40% of children in a December 2019 study say they've either received or sent a sext by the age of 13. It's disturbing. Rule 12, talk about social media and gaming. First, girls. Earlier in the podcast, I talked about how girls are much more into social media. Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, to name a few. It's not exactly uh, surprising. Girls bond by chatting, and social media falls right into girlhood social life as well as girlhood drama. Girls are twice as likely to be bullied. There is no longer empathy when a post hurts someone since the person bullying can't see the hurt on the person's face anymore. It makes bullying easy with very little consequence. You need to talk to your girls about that. However, we parents also need to understand the more subtle ways social media is used to bully. If you read a text or see a post that says someone is ugly or stupid, that's easy. What you can't see is an app like Snapchat. It has a feature where kids can set up what's called a streak. Here's how it works. 
Let's say I'm your friend and I send you a snap today. It's just a picture. Well, since we're good buddies, you send one back, and that's called a streak of one. Tomorrow, we do the same thing. That's a streak of two, so our number went up to two. The next day, three, then four, five, whatever. Let's say I have a few other friends besides you, and I've got like 10 streaks going with 10 different people at the same time. But you get mad at me. You know what you do because you're pissed? You break our streak. Yep, just cut it. We had 251 days of streaking, just gone, and I am not your friend anymore. You didn't use any words, did you? But all our friends know what you just did to me, even if my parents don't. How about Instagram? Super popular app. There are likes on Instagram. I post a selfie of me. Tweens and teen girls love selfies. And I get, let's say, 150 likes in a day. I'm popular, right? That must have been an amazing picture, right? Well, you post a selfie, and you get three likes in a day. You are so crushed and hurt, you take down the selfie. Another subtle form of bullying that parents and Bark-type software will probably never be able to detect. No words used again. TikTok works the same way. Those are just two forms of subtle bullying that can go on that parents miss all the time. You need to keep up on new apps and what they're about. In a few years, the two I mentioned here will be so last year, and and there will be new TikToks to replace them, and you'll have to understand them too. It's complicated, and it'll stay that way. Stay in touch with your girls. If you see big mood swings and isolation going on, it's something to worry about. Use websites like Common Sense Media, access and stay hip to keep up to date. Now for comments on boys. Boys, on the other hand, do participate in social media to a lesser degree, but they are more likely to dive deep into gaming. It's fun and boys connect by doing, not socializing. If you have a son who is a gamer, stay close instead of staying away. Learn what they like about the game they are playing what they are learning about life as they play. Many of these games require teamwork to win or concentration and skill. What is your son gaining? Fortnite and Minecraft are currently super popular games for younger boys, maybe tween and under. Play with them. Watch them play. Ask them about their characters or which friends are playing with them. Many boys will move on to more aggressive games in middle and high school that require more skill and dedication. My younger son in high school decided he wanted to be a professional gamer. His game of choice was the game called Counter-Strike. It's a wartime type game. I took a big gulp and went along for the ride for about five years. I stayed close. I asked questions about the game. We had gaming nights where his friends brought over all their gaming computers and could be in the same room instead of playing separately. My son learned many important skills that if I wasn't looking, I would have missed. He learned that picking the right teammates was hard. Not everyone had his dedication. It was frustrating. He learned that a team had to work together to win. No one hotshot could do it all. As he evolved, he became the head of his five-person team. He had to help resolve issues between teammates when they came up. It was amazing. I could see how really important life skills were being learned. He was a very good student and was heavily involved in school sports, so he had some balance in his life, but he still loved gaming. I could have spent years fighting with him to get off his computer and would not have much of a relationship with him today if I had done that. Don't get me wrong, I am not promoting gaming. I'm just saying that if your child is headed that way, Find the good as well as making sure there's a balance. My son just graduated from college in computer science. Phew. (laughs) He still loves to play games, but he did find out on his own after approaching the semi-pro level while in college that playing for fun was much more rewarding for him. He learned it, not me. 
I was able to love him when it got tough because we still had a relationship. Rule 13. Talk about porn. There are many ways parents can use software and hardware to assist us in the never-ending battle for control of screen time. In rule number five, we talked about parental controls. I absolutely want to make sure you're setting up as much filtering as possible to prevent porn from easily coming into your home and onto devices that travel outside your home. However, you need to talk about porn. Yes, it's a really awkward subject, but our kids will find porn one way or another. At first, in about late elementary school, it's accidental. A friend at school with an older sibling shows them on a phone or when they go over to another house for a play date that doesn't have good filters. Then curiosity hits and more porn gets into their lives. When the brain is under development, as it is in puberty, there are new neurological connections being made every day. If you listen to episode two of my podcast on the teen brain, you'll get more details on how that works. These connections on porn can get hardwired so that our kids' young minds might think that porn is quote-unquote normal sex. For some, healthy sexual relations are impacted in the long term, which is super sad. There's actually been a noticeable spike in sexual impotence of men in their 20s, largely due to porn. How do you talk to them? If you have younger kids, maybe like four to nine, there's a really nice book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Porn Proofing Today's Kids. If you Google how to talk to teens about porn, you'll get quite a few resources that have some really great suggestions for setting up discussions with your kids. I'll put these links to all of these on my show notes, and I really think that you should take the time to look them over and set up some discussions for your home. It is going to be awkward. And I will pray that it goes well for you. But please make the effort. Well, that's the end of my screen time rules. You made it. Woohoo. One through 13. Yippee. I hope you've got some really practical ideas about dealing with electronics in your homes. Please set up contracts with your kids and have some discussions about hard topics with them. Set yourselves up for success by working with your kids to tackle these issues Don't be a dictator. If you run into troubles, stop and take time to address them as a family. That's all for now. I would love it if you're listening, if you can forward this podcast on to a friend or two. There just isn't enough practical help for parents dealing with screens. I hope you think you've gained some good ideas that are worth passing on. Take care and be safe. Have a blessed rest of your day.